what we do is we hydraulically fracture the ship. Okay. So this is a, a sort of cartoon. By the way, uh, several of the figures that I'm showing here, including this one, came from this paper uh, from George King, uh, Hydraulic Fracturing 101. I think it was a 2012 SPE paper, but he's continued to update it with time. And uh, this is a hyperlink, so if you go to the web page where these slides are, you can actually click on that and you can go to the paper. And there's a lot of good information about hydraulic fracturing in that paper. And, you know, whereas most SP papers would be 15, 20 pages, this is like already over 100 pages. <laughs> so there's a lot of, lot of information. It's sort of a short book. So I, I took this cartoon from there. And so, you know, hydraulic fracturing is typically nowadays associated with horizontal drilling. Uh, but it's not a new technology by any means. Who knows when the first hydraulic fracturing was done? 47. Halliburton did it the first time. By 1950, 51, it was considered a commercial process. I mean, you could hire someone to come and hydraulically fracture your well. Uh, it's typically associated with oil and gas, but uh, and, and a lot of the complaints is a, a worry f about contaminating drinking water. But how do you think that you can, and people do, stimulate drinking water wells? You can hydraulically fracture drinking water wells, and people do hydraulically fracture drinking water wells. Uh, yeah, of course. So, you know, uh, now it's associated typically with horizontal drilling because, you know, with geosteering and other things, we can we can keep the horizontal leg of the well into tight formations. You know, tight t tight geologic formations. We typically would drill in the in like this picture shows. We drill in the direction of minimum horizontal stress such that when we produce the fractures, they grow perpendicular to that. We're doing these sort of bi long wing planar fractures is a kind of conventional look at what a hydraulic fracture looks like. Now the reality in shales, particularly like the Barnett shale, which is heavily natural fractures, there's lots of natural fractures in there, and those natural fractures influence the fracture propagation of these hydraulic fractures, and they don't look quite like this. They have lots more complexity. Okay. And so uh, that's sort of the research field right now is to look at the influence of hydraulic fractures and complex fracture networks uh, because this is why we believe the shells produce it like they do because they activate uh, the natural fractures that are in the rock already and um, you know, induce slip on them and other things and that in increases the conductivity. Okay? Uh, the cartoon, while it's a cartoon here, there's some, some reality in the sense that if all, you know, this, this shows that the two interior uh, fractures are growing much, much smaller radius than the, than, the, uh, than the outside fractures. So this would be a case where all of these are being pumped at the same time. And this is the type of behavior we actually see. Because what happens is uh, the terminology used in the industry, I don't really care for, but it, we're stuck with it at this point. They call it a stress shadow. So the, in other words, the idea that these, these, in, these fractures uh, basically in the, in the deformation, they're straining the rock, increasing the compressive stress on the interior fractures, and therefore it's harder for them to grow. And so their growth is retarded by the, the, by the presence of these exterior fractures. Okay? And uh, the exterior ones don't, aren't retarded as much because, because there's nothing pushing them from the outside. Right? And so uh, normally the well would be done. Uh, the, the scale's not quite right here. I mean, normally the fracture spacing would be on the order of um, you know, tens to hundreds of feet, right? And these would be done in stages along the horizontal well. So typically you go down to the toe. This is called the toe. That's the heel there. And so you go to the toe, and the typical thing they do is a so-called plug and perf, right? So they would plug the well and perforate the casing, if it's a case well. Uh, they perforate the casing with shape charges, and then they pump in high-pressure hydraulic fluid, and that produces the fractures. And then they move up the well bore, plug it again, perfect, produce hydraulic fractures and move up the well. And they'll do this up to maybe 30 times along a horizontal well. Right? And uh, now, now also, uh, you're starting to look at drilling. I mean, almost all the drilling now do is, is done in pad operations. So there won't be just a single, pad, a single well drilled, but rather from a single uh, drill head multiple horizontal legs. Am I 
like this. And so the optim and of course, in the same way that the stress shadow can affect uh, fractures along a single well bore, if you have to, depending on the spacing of the horizontal legs, they can also affect offset wells and the way they grow. And so now a lot of the research areas is optimizing the fracture sequencing at a pad level. And these are some new and creative ideas. A lot of the work has uh, been pioneered by uh, Dr. Sharma in this department uh, in terms of how to exactly do the fractures. So while I mentioned, uh, while I mentioned plug and perf as the most common way, and it still is, there are also more advanced tooling that they can basically put in line with the casing string and they call them sliding sleeves. So these are actually just sleeves that are in line with the casing string that, uh, given a variety of mechanisms, can open and close holes that expose you know, the, the well bore to the rock. Um, and so with that, you can do things, uh, and of course these are more expensive, but with that you can do things like the so-called Texas two-step. So in the Texas two-step, um, you would fracture the well, you move up far enough up the well such that you're, you're away from the stress shadow effect. So you'd move far enough up the well and you'd fracture again. And then you'd go back in between and you'd fracture. And because of that, uh, you need fractures to grow straight. I mean, if you just go, uh, you can go, you can get them to grow straight with fracture, with close fracture sequencing. So if you don't, if you didn't do that and you initially say fractured here and you moved up 10 feet and you fractured there, well the fracture is going to grow back towards the original fracture. And then if you moved up 10 feet, you're going to you're going to go back toward it to the extent that if you continue to do that, you can get fractures that are almost growing right along the well bore and therefore not stimulating as much of the rock as you want. So the Texas two step is sort of a way that you can have tight fracture spacings sequencing uh, but you have to do it in a, in a special sequence. And the only way to do this, you couldn't do this with plug and perf. You have to do it with this um, sliding sleeve mechanism. Another thing they do is they call so-called zipper fracks. So in a zipper frack, you'd frack this well, um, frack this well, 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 like that. And again, this is done to, uh, you know, opt this is done to help with the stress shadow effects that you can get the fracture to grow in sort of how you want them. And, uh, and so, of course, you know, in, in the pad drilling operations nowadays, you might have 10 or 12, 10 or 12 uh, horizontal legs. And so, you know, you really want to have to look at the optimization problem on a pad scale. You know, it's not just well by well. Uh, fracture fluid, you know, uh, we're not really going to talk much about that in this class. We're really going to talk about the mechanics of hydraulic fracturing. Uh, but with fracture fluid, um, you know, there's all kinds of exotic fluids you can use uh, from basically pure water, which is called sick water, which is you know, it's like 98% water, um, to cross-sink polymer gels, to uh, energetic things. You can even use natural gas. Right? And, and that's actually a very convenient thing to use in some respects. Because the good thing about if you frack with natural gas, when you turn the well back into production, you produce gas. And then you stick it in the pipe and you sell it. Uh, versus when you sick water fracture, you produce a lot of water when it comes back. You have to separate that water. You can't sell the water. Of course, you have to treat it and other things. Uh, so most of the uh, shale formations respond very well to sick water. Yeah, yeah, you do, but you also, the, the reaction or the, the expansion of the gas gives you some energy, and so that can add a little bit to the, to the fracturing process. Yeah, but, and we all think water is nearly incompressible, but compared, it's still about 50 times more compressible than a rock. So you actually get a lot of compressibility in the water even. Uh, but, but yeah, you're right. It's, it's not common to use it. It's convenient from the standpoint that you can just stick it in the pipe and sell it, right? But no, no, no. Um, 
not typically because of because of the compression part. You got to press it, right? So it's it's not that common, but it has it has been used. I, I think it's an opportunity area. I think it, I think you know there's a lot more research has been done on using soot water, and so I think we're to the point where we know probably better than any other fracture fluid what how to work with soot water. Um, but uh, but there's certainly an opportunity for research to use lots of other things, right? Um, I guess also I should mention that you know uh, after a certain time uh, of producing hydraulic fractures, you would follow that up with propping, right? So you would flow propping into this. Propping is basically just a very fine sand or possibly a hard man-made material that's very small, ceramic beads and other things, and that's flown in. Uh, uh, to basically try to prop open the open fractures or hold them open and remain conductive to the well. And while slick water is, you know, for easy to use and other things, it's probably not the best way to transport propping. So, um, you know, they, they probably neither would, would CNG. So that's where the, the cross sink gels and polymers and other things are more viscous fluids, it's a little bit better propping transport of things. But Anyway, so there's actually quite a bit of research still to be done in this in this area. But you know, I mean, this this whole field is a field that's led by basically the companies. And in terms, of, I mean, the the technology that they the technology advancements that they have done in the last ten years far exceed our academic knowledge of what's happening. They they do things and they work and they don't really know why. And you know, uh, in in the Eagle Forge Shell. Particularly, I mean, the amount of production a well gets is basically directly correlated to how much water you pump and how much sand you pump. Pump more water, more sand, you'll get more production. That's it. That's, that's the formula. It seems to be. Um, <coughs> yeah. I think it would have to take so much of it that it probably, <laughs> probably wouldn't be economic. You know, I mean, the thing with water is, you know, I mean, when it, when it flows back, no matter what it is, you have to do something with it, right? And we sort of have ways to treat water, recycle water, other things. Worst case, you inject it into a, a well, you know, a deep water injection well. Um, The the uh, water disposal, yeah, and I have some slides at the end. I don't know if we'll get to them uh, to talk about that a little bit. But yeah, so um, you know, this is another sort of cartoon, but it's a picture of, of the process. So after the well's drilled, this is a horizontal well, but the idea is the same, at least at the surface. Then you come in behind, and you have large 18-wheeler size pumps. Uh, the pressures required to produce these fractures are quite high, so we'll have many, many large 18-wheeler trucks uh, with high-pressure pumps on them. You'll have sand trucks providing propping. You'll have water tanks on the surface. And then I think the next picture is a picture of an actual frack job in the Barnett Shell. And all these red things are trucks. So that's like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 18 wheelers. One frack job, right? And all of this is water. These are all water. 150 water tanks around the edge. So it's a very large scale operation. Uh, I don't know that they necessarily zippered it, but they could be just. It, it's like I mean, it could be. I would say that given the the time, 2006, they're probably not actually zippering it, but they could be just setting up two for two operations at, at one time. Yeah. 